All right, you guys. Well, welcome to our second YIS Global uh, Online Club. I'm going to be handing it over today to Samia. Samia is our president of our student advisory board, and he's going to be your instructor today. Um, so, Samia, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Samia. Um, I'm the 2020 YIS Advisory Board President, and today I'm going to be doing our first lesson, which is going to be on um, essentially talking about who are investors. So before we begin, um, a lot of you hopefully will watch this in the future. Um, so I'll just start off with a quick idea of the week. Um, and this news actually came out really, really uh, recently, just a couple of hours ago. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States uh, actually pledged to keep um, their rates low over the next few years, uh, actually until 2023. So uh, that's interesting, you know, the federal, the market committee, they actually indicated that they're going to stay to the 0% inflation rate um, through 2023, um, which we haven't seen in a long time. And the federal chairman, his name is Jerome Powell, actually came out and said that um, until, you know, maximum employment rises because of, you know, COVID-19, they aren't going to hike the inflation rates. So that's just, you know, um, a quick kind of like a fact of the week, I'd say, um, of the market. And, you know, we'll see how that affects the Dow, um, uh, the S&P and NASDAQ um, over the next few years. Um, because especially this week, uh, they closed down about six points lower. So it could have an effect, it could not, we'll just have to wait and see. But um, yeah, so let's get into the lesson. I think I will share my screen, right? So, okay. So let me just do that really quickly. And we'll start off with our uh, Prezi presentation on who are investors. So maybe I should be able to see this. Yep. So unit one, who are investors? Um, we'll be talking about uh, why people invest what type of investors we think we are, um, and essentially learning a lot about compound interest and seeing how mon money accumulates over time. So let's say at the age of 16, you put down a certain amount of money. How does that money grow in the next 10, 15, 20 years? And we'll be analyzing a variety of scenarios with that. So let's get started. All right. So just a quick overview, right? Um, this lesson is focused on why people are motivated to invest. So we're all going to gain an understanding of short-term satisfaction versus long-term returns. And like I said, we're going to be learning about compounding interest and applying it to real life scenarios. So just a little bit on this, um, you know, many of us think that, you know, buying the next iPhone or, um, you know, buying the next technological device is going to give us this short-term satisfaction. But um, a lot of high profile investors generally recommend that if we rather use that money and invest it into like the stock market for a decade, let's say, that would yield a lot more return. Um, and as investors, we have to understand the delineation between how much are we willing to sacrifice to gain in the short term versus how much are we willing to sacrifice to gain in the long term, right? Um, so in this lesson, we're kind of, be, kind of going to be learning about that um, going through a couple of scenarios. And yeah, so let's go over a couple of objectives. Um, so everyone watching this can understand what they should be able to learn after. So first we're gonna be able to identify if we are spenders or investors. Essentially, do we have the natural urge to spend that check when we get it after you know payday? Or are we that type of person to use that check and put it in the stock market and see how much it grows over time? Right. Um, and then the second objective is going to be understanding the effects of compound interest. So um, putting our money into the S&P 500 and seeing how through the interest rate it compounds over time, over yearly, and how long it takes to compound and how much money we're going to end up at the end of the day. Um, or uh, many times compound interest, interest can be done, you know, using an institution like a bank. So these are the two main principles we're going to be covering in today's lesson. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump right into it. So this is a video uh, uh, that we're gonna we're gonna watch. It's just a quick five minute video, essentially talking about. So 
So Samia, I can't hear the audio on the video. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh... Is there a way I can? Can you hear it now? The seven golden rules of investing. Okay, sorry about that. Successful investors have been using these rules to make it rain for over a hundred years. These rules were developed by a few super investors, guys who have dominated the market and shaped how we think about investing. Guys like Warren Buffett, Benjamin Graham, and David Dodd. Being successful at anything requires following a set of rules and proper preparation. You will notice that a recipe for success in investing is easy to follow, but actually followed by few. Warren Buffett, the Michael Jordan of investing, says, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to be a great investor. Investing is not a game where the guy with the 160 IQ beats the guy with 130 IQ. That's the beauty of the stock market. Anybody can do it as long as they follow a simple set of rules. So let's get started. Rule number one, think long term. Warren Buffett said, if you aren't thinking about owning a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Smart investors know that to succeed, you need to think long term. If you are trying to time the market or double your money in a year, you're not investing. You're gambling and you're setting yourself up to fail. Rule number two, good companies make good investments and ditto for bad companies. Investors need to understand that investing is not like placing a bet on who's going to win the big game. It's not even about trying to predict which stock you think will rise the most. Fundamental investing is buying a tangible piece of a business or a share of that business and your investments are only as good as the companies in that portfolio. Warren Buffett said it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. Rule number three, buy with a margin of safety. Margin of safety is when an investor purchases a stock whose market price is significantly below the actual value of that company. The idea of margin of safety is that you want to buy a business at a price that's low enough that your assessment could be completely wrong, but you still wouldn't lose much. Margin of safety doesn't guarantee a successful investment, but it stacks the odds in your favor. Rule number four, do your own homework and own what you know. This rule applies to anything that you will tackle in life. There is simply no substitute for doing your own work. Peter Lynch said, know what you own and know why you own it. Rule number five, don't follow the herd, stay calm and rational. Trust your own judgment and don't follow the herd because every now and again, the herd runs off a cliff. It's easy to spot these moments of stupidity in hindsight, but not so easy at the time. So be prepared for the unexpected and try to avoid getting caught up in irrational exuberance or panic. Rule number six, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but don't have too many baskets either. Diversification is one of the most critical strategies for your portfolio. In case one stock blows up, it won't sink the entire ship. As much as we think as investors that we won't make a mistake, we will. And the masters do, and that's why we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. There's power in diversification. On the other hand, Warren Buffett taught that too wide diversification is only required when investors don't understand what they're doing. Rule number seven, never stop learning. The best investors don't ever think that they know everything. There's always something new to learn. That's the fun thing about investing and the markets are they're always different and companies are constantly changing. So never stop learning. This will give you the edge over all of the investors out there. So these are the seven golden rules of investing. Easy to learn, hard to do. I hope that you will enjoy this unit. And more importantly, I hope that you will use these rules to generate a lot of wealth over your lifetime for you and for your family. All right, so I think that was a really good video um, talking about the seven golden rules of investing. Um, our founder, um, James Fletcher, uh, gave some, you know, really 
really solid foundation rules. So uh, essentially when you go by those principles um, and obviously don't make irrational decisions, their journey in the stock market is going to be relatively safe. Um, and obviously there is a lot of volatility, but those seven rules um, in general kind of paint the picture for what exactly investing and investors do, right? So let's start off with the lesson. So first thing, um, let's start off with a brief introduction. So welcome to the Young Investor Society um, and thank you all for joining. Uh, our goal here is to help you become a master investor um, and help guide your journey throughout the stock market because it is a, um, you know, for many new investors could be kind of scary. Um, for experienced investors, it is still really volatile. So wherever you are, wherever you come from, um, our goal is to help you become a master investor and better efficiently use your money. All right. So let's start off with a, with a quick kind of questionnaire talking about, are you investor? Um, and essentially, like I said at the beginning, we're going to be dealing with, are we spenders or are we investors? All right. So we have a quick pop quiz here um, talking about uh, whether we are spenders or investors. So first question, right? Um, if I were to give anyone watching or anyone in this call $100 today or a new Mercedes next year, um, what would be the rational um, decision? Or, I mean, since it's a personal decision, it's your choice, but uh, what, what, what would you guys choose? $100 today or a brand new Mercedes next year? I would choose a brand new Mercedes next year. That's a really good choice, David. Um, so A is the cash, B is the car, and which one you'll take? David says he's going to take B. Obviously, why would you even be looking at the other options? Of course you take the car, right? Um, and this may seem a little bit intuitive to many people, um, and some it can still be confusing, right? Why, sh why can't I just take a hundred bucks today? Um, and you know, I can spend it right now. Or obviously um, in an investor mindset, we would take the Mercedes next year because we're getting more out of it, right? So second question I have is, I give you $100 today or should I give you $100 tomorrow? So again, A, B, um, which one would you guys pick? $100 today. Yeah, so why would you wait, right? Why not use the $100 right now, spend it, um, and you know what comes tomorrow comes tomorrow, right? You would not get anything in return for waiting. So jump on the opportunity, um, but this was just kind of a couple questions just to see if we were in the investor mindset or the spender mindset. So you are a spender if you don't get a return, right? So, you know, let's say you're working a job and, you know, you make a hundred bucks and right after your shift ends, you go and spend that hundred bucks. Um, that doesn't really give you that much of a return and it's more of a short-term satisfaction strategy. But if you're an investor, what we teach you at YAS, um, the future is worth for you because, you know, you're getting a hundred dollars today. And as we saw in the first question, you're willing to wait to get a new car in the future. So that kind of long-term thinking really pays off at the end. And we're training everyone here to be an investor. So the question of whether you invest, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, the question of whether you invest um, is really just a question of how much you believe tomorrow can offer. I think that's a really, really strong way to sum it up. So how much do you think, how, how much return do you think you're going to get tomorrow versus today, right? Um, and you, if you're willing to invest the money and you think tomorrow is going to give you, let's say $300 versus $100, then obviously you would want to invest that money and get that return. All right, so here are a couple of essential questions um, we have to discuss. Um, and you guys watching on YouTube or live um, can write these down on a piece of paper. How much cash would you be willing to give us today in return for a promise to receive $500 five years from now? So essentially what this is asking is, how much are you willing to put down today in order to receive, 
let's say 10 times, five times in amount, five years in the future. And this really gets us into the investor mentality because it allows us to see um, how much we're willing to sacrifice in order to get that long-term return. Um, and for many people, they're willing to put down zero. Um, other people are willing to put down 50 and even 499. So it really depends on who you are as an investor and how much you're willing to sacrifice in order to gain that return investment. All right, so the truth is we are all investors, right? We all want to make that long sum of money um, in the future. And to be honest, investing into companies or portfolios is the best way to grow your money in the long term. So in order to build this wealth as an investor, we have to ask ourselves two very, very important questions. And everyone watching should write these down because this will guide your path in terms of how much you invest and how you invest. So the first question we have to ask is, are you able to save each year? And saving money is, I think, one of the most important things to invest. Um, because if you don't save any money, if you don't have savings, you can't allocate that money to the right sectors. And thus, you won't be able to get that return that you want. So the first question is, are you able to save each year? And um, your answer to that question should absolutely be yes. You should try to save as much money as you can. Um, and actually dedicate a portion of your savings to investing. The second question we ask is, when you save, where do you put the money? So this is also a really important question, right? Um, and as we'll see in the next couple of slides, there are a variety of institutions where you can put your money in, um, whether it be the bank, the stock market, um, S&P, the stock, uh, you know, long-term growth uh, ETFs, you know, real estate, there's a lot of different areas where you can put your money, um, but essentially talking about how do you save and when you save, where do you put the money? These are the two questions that we have to ask when we're talking about investing. All right. So, you know, many of you may be asking, does it really even matter where you put your money, right? Why can't I just put it in the bank or why can't I just throw all of it in the stock market? Um, the truth is it really does matter where you put your money because that defines the risk that you're taking and also the reward. All right. So of course it does, right? Um, the more money that you can put in the stock market early, the more magnifying effect of compound interest or compounding can work in your favor. Um, and if people watching don't know what compound interest is, um, essentially it accumulates the wealth, um, depending on how frequently you compound it. So if I'm compounding my, my um, let's say, investment monthly, then I'm obviously going to make a lot more money. Um, and over time, that compounding generates to a lot of wealth. So it definitely, definitely does matter where you put your money. And I think this is a really great quote by Albert Einstein. He said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world, right? So um, it's just that magnificent because you can multiply your wealth very, very fast. Um, and thus, it's really, really important to understand how compounding interest and its subsequent formulas work. All right, so this is our first learning activity. Um, essentially, we're going to be discussing compound interest. So we're going to take this scenario. Um, let's assume that we're 20, someone or, um, you know, a person is 20 years old, and they just took a job as a firefighter, right? And that's their childhood dream to become a firefighter. Um, but their salary is meager. You know, they're not making that much money every year, but they have a goal. And that goal is to save $1,000 every single year and put it into a retirement account. So let's say you work and you save for the next 50 years, $1,000 every, every year for the next 50 years until you retire. Remember the second question, where do you put your money? Okay, so let's go through a couple of scenarios on where exactly you could put this $1,000 and how putting it in different institutions changes the amount of money you're able to make as you go on, okay? So the first place we're gonna put it is our savings account. Now this could be, you know, checkings account with your bank, um, but if you put $1,000 every year for 50 years at a 0% annual return rate, you're gonna accumulate $50,000, right? Um, and obviously that seems like a lot um, over 50 years, but, um, to some, you know, 0% annual return, that doesn't really cut it, right? You want to have some sort of compounding interest percentage that you can multiply your wealth by. So sure, the savings account does get you a pretty hefty return, but it's not the maximum, right? 
So the second um, place we can put it is bonds or real estate, right? So this could be, uh, you know, in, into certain properties, um, investments, houses um, across the country. There's a lot of really, really powerful investors like um, Grant Cardone um, who invest in a lot of real estate. So, you know, investing in real estate is always a good thing. And 3%, if we just take 3%, um, which is the average annual return, that $1,000 every year for 50,000, for 50 years, excuse me, becomes um, $116,000. So you can see clearly that versus, um, you know, your savings account to real estate, the amount of money you make almost doubles with just a 3% annual return. So that just shows you how important that um, percentage is in terms of discussing compound interest, right? The third place we can put it is into the stock market. Um, and this right here is going to yield you um, the highest amount of money. So $1,000 every year for 50 years at a 10% average annual return rate, which is many times what the Dow um, or the S&P 500 returns. There's about a 9.8% um, average annual return rate. And over 50 years, we're going to accumulate almost $1.3 million. So comparatively, when we started off um, with just our, you know, savings account, we had $50,000 at a 0% interest rate. Now, when we put it into the stock market at 10%, that number um, is multiplied by, you know, it's tenfold, over tenfold, right? So that just shows you how much of a return you can get when you're talking about investing into the stock market versus just putting it in your savings account. And even better is let's say you end up beating the stock market, which a lot of investors tend to do, right? You figure out the strategy, you follow the seven rules um, and you end up beating the stock market. That could give you a 20% average annual return, which is you know insane. And that over 50 years would equal a hundred and almost $10 million. So you can see the, the magnifying effect of compound interest through the four scenarios that we just went through, right? We saw that with our savings account, we just had $50,000 at a 0% annual interest rate. When we went to the real estate market, we built that up to about $100,000. When we went to the stock market, you know, everyone, like uh, just a 9.8, 10% average annual interest rate, which um, everyone, um, if you invest in the S&P, would get the return. That number jumped to $10 million, to excuse me, $1 million. And let's say we end up beating the stock market and getting that 20% annual interest rate that number jumps to $110 million. And that's just with saving $1,000 every single year. So even at the position of a firefighter, the scenario we're discussing, that number is very, very, um, it should be very, very like likely for people to invest. It's not a you know massive risk factor and nor is it um, a very small amount of money. It's kind of in the middle where you're able to manage $1,000. And if you end up beating the stock market, um, the, the magnifying effect Will definitely compound in. All right, so let's talk about how we can start start um, investing early, right? So let's say we start investing or saving, excuse me, a thousand dollars per year at the age of forty, which is generally pretty late. Um, I would say that in the past few years, there have been a lot more young investors. Um, you know, that that just goes to show you the Young Investor Society and our impact, and you know, a lot of um, young individuals have started investing their money which I think is really, really powerful because uh, the, the, the earlier you start, the more returns you're going to have. So let's say someone starts at the age of 40 um, and saves $1,000 per year. At the age of 70, they're going to have, um, I'd say, about $200,000. But let's say we start 10 years earlier at the age of 30. Look how that number jumps over $300,000. By, by the age of 70, if we start 10 years earlier, we're going to have accumulated over half a million dollars. And let's say we start at the age of 20, um, which a lot of us investors um, could when we become, you know, when we have the, the capital, the thousand dollars to save. If we invest um, at the age of 20, if we start earlier, 20 years earlier, um, again, tenfold investment, um, that, num that number jumps to $1 million. That just shows you that the earlier you start, the better because you have more time to save and you get more experience down the road. So the key thing here to take is that you should start as early as possible um, and that will warrant the highest yields.
Oh, sorry about that. All right, so the next slide. So yeah, so let's understand um, essentially the way compound interest works. And you know, this is taught a lot of times um, in math classes, they just give you a formula um, and they just, uh, they just tell you to plug in some numbers and find out the end of interest. But in order to actually understand how compound interest works, we have to understand the factors that make up compound interest. So firstly, we have um, uh, the high return coming in from the stock market. And secondly, we have starting early, right? So the earlier you start, the higher your investment is going to be, because like I said, you have more time to invest, um, you have more money being accumulated. Um, so overall, you're going to get a higher return at the percentage rate um, that is there in the stock market. So let's say we start at the age of 15, right? Um, many of us students um, watching this video are around this age, 15, 16 years old. And let's say we saved $1,000 every year. Um, by the age of 70, that would jump to $2.2 million. So just starting early, just five years earlier, increases, increases our investment um, almost two times, right? Um, that just shows you again, the power of starting early. I think this um, uh, visual is, is really good representation of, um, you know, just decreasing or starting earlier and earlier and how the trend um, of how much you make continues to go up and it's exponential, right? Um, this isn't a linear trend where, you know, there's a set amount increasing every year. It's exponential. So the earlier you start, um, the curve, I mean, a lot of, you know, us know what exponential curves are. The curve goes up much, much faster. So at the age of 15, um, if we save $1,000 per year, we're making almost $2.2 .2 million. And I think that's really powerful. So um, there's just some discussion questions, um, you know, people are watching live, just, th just think about this. So what do you think are the effects if the firefighter started or didn't start investing in the stock market at the age of 20, right? Um, so obviously, if you started at the age of 20, he would make a lot more money. If you started later, for example, at the age of 40, which he did in this scenario, um, he made, you know, he still made a sum of money. But if he started 20 years earlier, um, he could have made a lot more. So that just shows you the power of starting early. And the earlier you start, um, the higher your yield rate will be. All right. So let's jump to, all right. So this is just, you know, that visual representation of how much you would earn every year, um, depending on what uh, age bracket you started in. So um, if you, at 40 years old, $1,000 per year at about the 9.8% interest rate. Um, remember how we talked about how the stock market, the annual yield tends to be around 10%. At the age of 70, you would make about $190,000, right? Um, and let's say 10 years earlier, start at the age of 30, that number jumps to about half a million. And then 10 years earlier, again, you know, $1 million. So exponentially, that number is increasing. Um, so the earlier you start, the better. And for every investor, I think that's, that's a really good um, principle to guide by. Always start early. Um, and you don't have to save $1,000 per year. Um, saving a little bit of money and investing it um, and compounding that over time is still going to give you that yield rate, um, that return that you want. All right. So, yeah. So again, discussing what do you think um, would be the impacts on the firefighter if he started at the age of 20, um, 30, maybe even 15, right? Um, obviously that interest rate would accumulate pretty, pretty fast. And yeah, like we discussed before, at 15, with a 9.8% interest rate, just putting that into the S&P 500, that person could make $2.2 million by the age of 70. So again, you know, just when we think about investing and investors, um, understand that investing early is the key because uh, the earlier you start, the more you save, the more you're going to make. All right. Um, so since we don't have that many people in the live session right now, I think we're going to hold off on the Kahoot. Um, cause we do have a couple other videos to get through, but yeah. So these are some additional resources. I think everyone, um, watching could use, you know, we have our young investors website. 
we have the terms, we have a lot of good um, uh, financial literacy um, websites here, like Seeking Alpha is really good, Motley Fool, Investopedia, um, Yahoo Finance. Um, so, you know, to learn more about um, investors and how to invest, I think, um, you know, you could you know, visit a lot of these websites because they tend to be very, very resourceful. Um, and uh, they give you a lot of information on, you know, new stocks and things like that. So um, visit these websites um, and, you know, they, they have a lot of good articles about um, investing. So, yeah, um, that's the end of the Prezi presentation on who are investors um, and why you should invest. I think we're going to transition over now to our lesson plan, which kind of just kind of um, goes a little bit more in depth about um, our investing and investors. So we have this video here um, from our CEO, James Fletcher, that I'm going to play. Um, and it gives a really good overview on uh, what, what we just talked about and kind of sums it up. Um, and then we'll, we'll end off the, the lesson by taking our quiz. Welcome, young investors. Sonia, my audio went out again on the video. Okay, is it good enough? What it means to be an investor. Right. So when you hear the word investor, what do you think about? Do you think of a, a greedy investor on Wall Street? Or do you think of someone building wealth and becoming wealthy over time? So let's start with a question to find out whether you're a spender or an investor. I'll give you $100 today, or if you wait one year, I will give you a brand new Mercedes. Which one will you take? Will you take the cash? Will you take the car? Or of course you'll take the car. Anyone would wait one year for a brand new car. Okay, so let's, let's try another one. I will give you $100 today for, or $100 one year from now. Which one would you take? Of course you would take the money today. It wouldn't make any sense to wait a year for, for the same return today. When you're investing, you're making a decision of how much worth the money is for you today versus how much is it for you tomorrow. Benjamin Graham, the teacher of Warren Buffett and one of the greatest investors of all time, said that investors are believers in a better tomorrow. Okay, so let's try another question and let's make it a little more complicated. Five years from now, I will give you $500. Take out a notepad, maybe think about it. And how much would you be willing to put aside today for $500 five years from now? Would you be willing to set aside $100? Would you be only willing to set aside or $450 for $500? Would you only be willing to set aside $50 today? And what does your answer to that question tell you about yourself? So if I'm only willing to set aside, you know, $499 to get $500 a year from now, which basically means my, my money, um, I, I'm willing to invest money for a small gain five years from now, that probably tells you that you're a saver. And it also tells you that you're probably pretty risk intolerant, that you're very cautious. What about if I'm willing to put aside $50 today for $500 five years from now. That tells you that you're willing to take more chances, that you're willing to probably be more aggressive and that, and that your money means more to you now than it does uh, five years from now. So the truth is we are all investors. If we think investing is only for those, those highbrow financial types on Wall Street, the reality is that everyone is an investor. We all make money during our lifetime and we're all in the business of saving and investing for a down payment on a home, for our kids' college, and we're all investors. And the question is, how good of an investor are you? The question of how much wealth you will build in your life really boils down to two questions. The first question is, are you able to save each year? And how much you're able to save each year? And the second question is, when you save, 
where do you put the money? So that's it. Can you save money? And then when you save it, how do you, where do you put it? And can you invest it? So does it really matter where you put your money? Uh, yeah, of course it does. Um, investors talk about something called compounding or compound interest. Have any of you heard that phrase before? It, it basically talks about the magnifying effect of money, that money is magnified over time and that starting earlier allows you to compound more. Albert Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. So let's, let's explore the power of compound interest and, I, and let's start with handout 1.1. Take a minute and go through this handout and then we'll come back and discuss it. All right, so I think we, we went over um, that. Um, so I'm just gonna, I think we already did that activity, so. The activity? Yeah. So what did we learn? Did you invest in rare art? Did you invest in real estate? Did you invest in growth stocks with the highest return, but then go down every five years? So what are the answers? If you're in 25 years, the answer is growth stocks would give you $167,422. At 50 years old, the answer is growth stocks again would give you $1,249,661. And then at age 70, what is the answer? Again is growth stocks, 6 million, $239,862. So how is that possible? Growth stocks had the highest return, but also would go down every five years in our example. Rare art, for example, at age 70, which never went down, which were safe and then tripled at the end, would give you $300,000. And real estate, which was safe and, and went up every 10 years, would only give you $627,000. So what do we learn from this activity? One thing we learn is that if your time horizon is long, your, your best interest is to maximize your returns. And so in this activity, growth stocks had the highest um, annual return and they gave you the highest return. So I hope that helps you understand compound interest. I hope the other takeaway for you is if you start early and you can earn a 10 or 12% return compounded per year, Look at those numbers. By, by the time you're 70 years old, you could achieve $6 million, over $6 million. So the power of compounding is incredibly powerful. Let's go through one more example here in our presentation. So let's assume you're 20 years old and you just took a job as a firefighter, which is your childhood dream. Unfortunately, your salary is meager, but you make it a goal to save $1,000 per year and put it in a retirement account. You work and save for the next 50 years until you retire. So, so 50 years. I think we went through the scenario already. So if it's okay, I'm just gonna kind of skip through the part um, where uh, we kind of answer a few important questions about the stock market. Right? If you enjoyed that lesson, let's take a couple of the most common questions after we learn about that lesson. The first one is, what do we do when the stock market goes down? And how are we able to compound and make money when we know that the stock market has terrible periods where the market goes down 20, 30%? It's a great question and it is absolutely true that there are periods where the markets will go down and they may even go down by what we call a bear market. They go down by more than 20 or 30%. But over any 10 year period in history, the markets have always averaged up. Even if you bought at the worst period of time, right before the Great Depression in 1929, 10 years later, you have always made money, even then. And long-term, almost over any decade, you have been able to achieve 10% returns in the stock market. And so while the stock market will go wildly up one year and wildly down the next, if you're able to be patient, and save that money for 10 years, then you're able to achieve that long-term rate of return. Okay, second question. How do we calculate compound interest? So in the, in the worksheet, there were some questions of 
how do we calculate the, the how do we calculate compound interest, especially when we don't have a calculator? Are there ways on the computer or other ways to calculate it? It's a great question. And actually, when when I calculate compound interest as an investor, oftentimes I use Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. And so in the worksheet, which we did, we took the original amount and multiplied it. If it was a 5% return the next year, we multiplied it by 1.05. And then in the next year, if it was a 3% decline, we multiplied it by 0.97, which is one minus that percentage. You can set up a formula in Google Sheets, or you can go online to compound interest calculators. These will help you co calculate compound interest. Online, there's many tools where you can just put in a rate of return and, and how many years for this rate of return, and it will give you the number. So I encourage you to go online and, and, and experiment with Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets, and this will help you calculate compound interest in a more seamless, easier to use manner. Uh, third question, last question that we often get is, okay, James, you've told us about the power of compounding. I believe you, I wanna start investing. How do I actually start investing? So how do I actually start investing today? And what I would tell you is there's many ways. Um, go to a, your local brokerage and look up custodial accounts if you're a teenager or if you're an adult. Um, Go to your local Fidelity or Schwab or whatever brokers you want to use, and they will help you get started. There's also great online brokerages. So brokerages like E-Trade or Interactive Brokers. And then more and more, you're seeing mobile brokerages or, or investment accounts made for apps. So here we have Robinhood, which is a free stock trading app. Unfortunately for teenagers, they don't have custodial accounts yet. So we like to recommend uh, Stockpile, which is a great app for teenagers. And actually, as YIS members, you'll get five free dollars if you go on the dollar a day section of the website. You can get five free dollars to start investing at Stockpile. So those are some ways to actually start investing. The second thing I would say in answer to that question is how do I actually get started is when you get started investing, the most powerful way is to automate the investment process. So take a bank account and then have it automatically transfer, let's say $50 per month. And then you can tell your interactive brokers account or your Fidelity account to take that $50 a month and automatically invest it in the, in the stock market. And I would recommend just a simple ETF or a simple S&P 500. And this is a way where you can start investing young and automate that savings and investing process. Thank you so much for your time. The last um, article I'd like to give you as part of this lesson is a challenge. And I would like to have you take a minute, um, take out a note card. If you're taking notes, write it down. And I want you to make an investment goal. What is one goal that you want to save money for? Maybe it's for a wedding, maybe it's for a down payment on a car, maybe it's a house, or maybe it's just your dream is you want to retire when you're 70 years old and you want to buy a house in the Bahamas. Whatever goal you have, write it down right now. And I want you to think, what rate of return do I need to earn to achieve this goal? And then to achieve this goal, this rate of return, what do I need to do to achieve it? And where do I need to put my money? And this will help you um, make a plan and so you can achieve your investment goal. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope the FAQ section is helpful. And I hope more than anything that you'll start to invest now and put money in your future account. Thanks. All right. So um, I think that's a really good video. Um, and it really went in depth into you know, some of the main aspects of the stock market um, it also mentioned a couple of really, really good apps. Um, a lot of people, you know, watching this video might be custodials and, you know, maybe um, not enough to trade because you have to be, I think, um, 18. So um, Stockpile is a really good one that um, YAS recommends. Um, so yeah, just kind of uh, looking at the stock market in general and understanding who are investors. So kind of just to sum up, um, remember that um, when you hear the word investor, um, you might think of some person who's on Wall Street in a suit, um, 
uh, and is just, you know, at NASDAQ, but everyone I think is an investor because we all want to put down money for some greater return, right? And um, whether that's, you know, the business owner, the family, um, or a college student, um, it kind of kind of encompasses all of us. So um, remember the two essential questions we ask is, are you able to save each year? And when you save, where do you put the money, right? Um, so when we talk about those two questions, we're able to kind of derive um, how much we're going to make over a certain period of time. So remember we talked about all these hypotheticals, um, talking about the savings account, we talked about bonds, we talked about the stock market and essentially how wealth accumulates through compound interest. Um, and remember, the most important thing is to start early. We cannot stress this enough. You know, this, the earlier you start, the higher return you get. And um, we saw that with the numbers, right? At age 15, we accumulated over $2.2 million um, by the age of 70 if we just save $1,000 every year. And at age 20, if we start, we accumulate over $1.3 million. Um, so the earlier you start, the more you're going to get. And remember, the two most important critical factors um, of compound interest are to earn a high return and to start early. All right. So I think we're going to close it out with our um, quiz that we have um, on the bottom right here. And so people watching can, uh, we can all participate. So this is the first quiz um, on who are investors, right? So let's, let's look at the first question. So who do you think an investor is? Um, do you think they're a believer in a better tomorrow? Do you think they're someone with lucrative inside information? Maybe someone looking to make a quick buck or someone who's motivated by greed? What do you guys think? Who do you think an investor is? Uh, I think an investor is someone, a believer in a better tomorrow. Great answer, David. So um, an investor is a believer in a better tomorrow, right? Um, an investor wants to help the future they want to they're not they're not always there just to scam people and make a profit um they want to they want to accumulate the wealth and um put it into something that affects um someone positively all right the second question how much wealth will you earn in your life boils down to two questions how much are you able to save and second um did the stock market go up over your lifetime did you earn more than one million dollars per year where do you put your money or were you able to make a safe and steady return each year? What is, what is the second question when we talk about wealth? Uh, where do you put your money? Yeah, great, great answer, Ryan. So um, remember the second question is where do you put your money? We talked about how we can put it into, you know, our checkings account, or, excuse me, our savings account, uh, bonds, real estate, and maybe even the stock market, right? All right, there we go. All right, third question. Um, is a bear market, all right? So the stock market, S&P 500, has averaged what return per year for the past century? Unable to quantify 5.8%, 9.8%, or 12.8%. Any, any idea? This one is a kind of a tougher question because, you know, if, if you don't invest, you generally don't know. But um, the answer- not quite 8%. Yeah, exactly. 9.8%. Um, so around 10% is the average annual return rate. And remember how we talked about the firefighter, right? Um, and at 10%, $1,000 per year, that yielded him about um, like $1.3 million. So um, just putting your money into the S&P 500 without any other um, you know, assets can still get you that large sum of money. All right. Um, fourth question, Einstein called what the eighth wonder of the world. The Great Wall of China, structured finance, compound interest, or debt? Compound interest? Yeah, compound interest, right? Um, and he called it this because he understood the power of magnification and how wealth accumulates over time. Um, and that's why it's such a powerful concept um, because it affects so many people and can make um, a lot of people richer really, really fast. All right, and then our last question is, um, your brother is starting, a high, starting high school and he wants to have millions of dollars by the time he retires. You tell him about compound interest and that two most critical factors to make money multiplies to earn a high return and invest in technology stocks, start early, avoid losses, or don't take on debt. 
So um, what is the second prong of compound interest, basically? Uh, start early. Exactly, starting early, right? We talked about the impact of starting early um, and how that wealth accumulates over time. The earlier you start is the better. Um, I've said this multiple times throughout this presentation because it's that important. Um, the earlier you start, the more your yield it's going to be. Um, and so I recommend everyone to start as early as possible um, and just save a little bit by little bit. And eventually you'll get to the mark where you're able to make um, a lot of money just by investing into the stock market. All right. So I think we got a hundred on the quiz because we got every question right. Um, and uh, I think this is a really good lesson, introductory lesson, um, essentially understanding who we are as investors and what role do we play. Um, and subsequent lessons will teach us how to take these um, principles and kind of apply them into actual investing and um, the, real, the real market and strategies and things like that. And yeah, thank you. All right, Samia, thank you so much for, for being instructor today and uh, walking us through that. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to open it um, for anyone who has any questions.